Paul isn't just teaching different ideas here. He's explaining a process. And so I want us to understand that because some of the verses that are cherry-picked out that cause so much trouble for those of us of the Torah-observant community, they're not in the context of the process. They're not understanding how they fit into the process. Don't forget the state you were in. You were Gentiles. And how do you know you were a Gentile? Because some of you say, well, I was a Jew or I was this. No, no. Gentile is meaning outside the camp. You can still be a Jew and be outside the camp. You could be any of the, t- of the 12 tribes and be outside the camp. What makes the designation of in or outside the camp? Well, what makes the designation is you are designated by your actions. In other words, what you are actually covenanted to. Are you covenanted to the world or are you covenanted to the covenant of Abba that was given at Mount Sinai? Let's understand that based on this verse, there is no such thing as a Gentile believer. If you are a believer, you are Israel. Because if you're a believer, according to Yaakov, according to James, your actions will manifest out to demonstrate your belief. You're going to walk in such a way. Now, we're contrasting the walk. In verse 2, they're walking in accordance to the world and Hasatan. When you choose to walk in accordance to Elohim, Now that walk is the difference, that shows what you believe. If you are walking the walk and you are, quote unquote, a believer, then you're Israel, not Goyim. Okay, this this is mention of making both one. He is our peace, he has made both one. Both what? If you're making both, there's two, there's gotta be two of something, because both is not five, six, or eight, it's two. What both? Well, it could it be that the next verse earlier where he talked about circumcision and uncircumcision? So he's saying he made both one. He's talking about those that were citizens and those that were previously excluded from citizenship. He made them both one and brought peace between the two because can you imagine going back 2,000 years ago and seeing the animosity between the Jew and the Gentile? It's still today. And so this enmity thing is talking about something that's an adversary or an enemy. And the enemy's lined up between what? Hasatan and Elohim. Is that not exactly the same thing going on in Ephesians chapter 2? You were once walking according to the world and Hasatan, and now you're going to walk according to Elohim. The enmity was between those two elements, the people of the one with the people of the other. So therefore, the people of the, of the covenanted, quote unquote, people did not want to let the uncovenanted people in. They didn't want them to become part of the one renewed new man. He's talking about that when you're in the spirit, we're going back to verse six, right? The mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit, the way of thinking according to the spirit, which is the fullness of the intent of how Yahweh intended things to be. It's not some thing that you now have to feel, I have to feel something, I gotta hear a voice, I gotta, that's all your emotionalism that came out of the lies that you were told in the Pentecostal church and the charismatic movement. I'm not attacking you for when you were in there, you were lied to, it's not your fault. Okay, but you were lied to that somehow this emotion-based thing is actually more real than what actually is real. Now, what do we see here being compared? The deeds of the body and the deeds of the righteousness, the deeds of the Torah, the deeds of the spirit. But yet we're still swimming upstream against all of those years of teaching saying that somehow the spirit is something you feel, right? I'll feel it. I'll, I, you know, I had a check in my spirit. You might want to check which spirit that is that you're feeling a check in your spirit. Oh, but Christianity wants you to blame Hasatan for everything. Blame demons for everything. They have nothing they can do to you or with you or through you that you don't already have in you. Clean it up and they go away. It's like, you know what, people that have like bug problems in their house, it's because they got food lying around all over the place. Guess what, you clean all that up, the bugs go away. Because there's nothing there. It's the same thing. If you don't provide anything for them to use or to work with, they're not going to be there. They'll go find someplace else to get what they want. You cannot be friends with the world and also with Elohim. There, there's, there's an adversarial relationship there. You can't be sitting on, and, and straddling the fence. 
Let's think about it. That's kind of painful. Don't straddle the fence. Get on one side or the other. That's the old lukewarm thing. I wish you were hot or cold because then I could work with you. The problem when you're lukewarm is you think you're on the hot side of the fence when you're on the cold side also. And he's like, if you were all on the cold, I can wake you up and say, hey, wake up. You're on the wrong side of the fence. But see, if you already think you're on the right side of the fence, it's hard because you're sort of partially on that side already, but not enough, not all the way. So you're lukewarm. And that's why we have this big problem judging people. How can you judge somebody? You got your own problems, your own issues, just because you don't have their issue and you think you're all, well, I'm, you know, I never had a problem with that. Well, but they never had a problem with your issue. Boom, you're back on even ground. So why, why are we judging? Thinking we're so much better than everybody. Mostly because a lot of the people we judge, their issue is more public and more obvious and yours is more hidden. And you're so proud of yourself that nobody knows just how messed up you are. I know, you're like, Rabbi, when are you going to learn your better bedside manner here? This is terrible. It's not just enough that you're getting your head straight. you got to get the heart straight because when they're not in sync, guess what you have? Enmity. You know, but you don't do. So what was Paul saying? He was saying, I've got a head-heart issue. I, what I know I shouldn't do, I'm still doing because my heart's in a problem. And what I, what I know I should do, I don't do because my heart's the problem. My head knows. I got the head knowledge. I know what I should and shouldn't do, but my heart's got it backwards. And so what do I do? The heart's going to win. It's not enough to know in your head. The law wasn't the problem. You and how you dealt with it or didn't deal with it. Remember, the contrast was in the beginning in chapter 2, in the beginning of chapter 2, you had no Torah. You walked according to the world. And so what did you have? You had death. But then Messiah called you into the truth, into the light, into understanding about the commandments. They bring life. And then you now made a change in what you were following. So that's that law of sin and death versus law of life. So let's be careful that we don't have, allow for the mainstream of Christianity's cherry picking of that little piece of verse 15 to justify the law was the problem. Because you take that little piece out, just that little piece, and nothing that Paul says here even remotely hints that the law was the problem. He says that a lack of law was the problem. That's that Gnosticism. We, I, I need to know, especially that secret hidden stuff. I got to know. I got to understand everything. Why? But I have to. But why? Because I'm craving it. I'm desiring it. And you know what that does? That leads you into all kinds of new doctrinal understanding crack, I call it. You know, we need your fix. The new, that newest, latest hidden knowledge is like crack. We're addicted to it. Be okay with not understanding. I tell people all the time, look at the heroes. Did Noah understand when he was told to build an ark? No. Did Abraham understand when he was told to go take his son and offer him? No. Did Abraham understand when he told him to go and leave his, pe his family? The initially, he said, Abraham, yep, go where I send you to go. No. Did the people have any idea where they were going when they left Egypt? No. I mean, why is it that we think that understanding is so important? We need to have this fullness of the two becoming one renewed man where we're walking in the way that we love Elohim with all our might and strength and we're loving each other correctly. And how do we get there? Well, first of all, we got to get our own agendas out of the way and let the book speak for itself.